So we're looking at a commentary by Henry Morris on this deal that Laban has with his uncle, or Jacob has with his uncle Laban. Jacob agreed that none of the solid color animals would be taken into his own flocks. If any should be found by Laban in Jacob's flocks, Laban would have the right to take them out. Only those future animals that would be born speckled or striped or spotted or abnormatively colored in some way would become Jacob's wages. The dominant color traits in Laban's flocks and herds was were evidently white among the sheep, black among the goats, and brown among the cattle. Most of the animals were of these colors, but there were a few that were spotted and speckled among the cattle and goats and brown among the sheep. It was of such as these that Jacob's pay would be. However, Jacob further proposed that not only would none of these living speckled animals be taken by him, but they would not even be used for breeding purposes. He would separate them into a separate flock and keep them away from the normal colored animals. Only such spotted and speckled animals as would be born in the future from the normal colored animals would become his. Sounds like a lot of hocus pocus. Since the solid colored animals were by far the more numerous, and since it was much less likely that they would bear striped and speckled offspring than those animals that were already striped and speckled, or brown among the sheep, this arrangement clearly was highly favorable to Laban, and of very doubtful value to Jacob. Indeed, it was an act of pure faith on his part. He had put himself entirely at God's mercy. It would be up to the Lord to indicate by a very unlikely set of circumstances whether Jacob should prosper personally or not. Laban, who was willing to make a far more generous outlay than this to keep Jacob immediately jump at the chance to seal such a bargain, he would lose nothing that now belonged to him. And in all appearances, Laban stood not to be liable for losing much in the future, for Jacob would only possess the abnormative animals, which were far fewer in number and far less likely to breed many other abnormative animals. Jacob had no breeding stock of his own, and none of the animals from which his pay was to, be, to come would be likely to produce spotted and speckled progeny of their own without a spotted and speckled population with which to interbreed. So we're moving on in Genesis 30. That same day he removed all the male goats that were all streaked and spotted, and all the speckled spotted female goats, all that had white on them, and all the dark colored lambs, and he placed them in the care of his sons. Then he put a three-day journey between himself and Jacob, while Jacob continued to tend the rest of the Laban's flocks. Now here's Morris's comment on this. Careful consideration. Laban decided not to trust Jacob to keep the two sets of flocks separate. He himself went through the flocks and cutting and culling out all the striped and spotted goats, the, the brown sheep and other odd colored animals, and put them in a separate flock, thus assuring himself that Jacob would not leave any of them in the main flock for additional breeding and the possibility of further abnormative offspring, then to make it quite impossible in the future for there to be any mixing, he gave the speckled flock into the hands of his sons and told them always to keep them at least three days' journey away from the main body of animals, which would be tended by Jacob. Genesis 30, 37 to 43. Jacob, however, took fresh-cut branches from poplar, almond, and plane trees and made white stripes on them by peeling the bark and exposing the white inner wood of the branches. Then he placed the peeled branches in all the watering troughs so they would be directly in front of the flocks when they came to drink. When the flocks were in heat and came to drink, they made it in front of the branches, and they bore young that was streaked or speckled or spotted. Jacob set apart the young of the flock by themselves, but made the rest face the streaked and dark-colored animals that belonged to Laban. Thus he made separate flocks for himself and did not put them with Laban's animals. Whenever the stronger females were in heat, Jacob would place the branches in the troughs in front of the animals so that they would mate near the branches. But if animals were weak, if the animals were weak, he would not place them there. So the weak animals went to Laban and the strong ones to Jacob. In this way, the man grew exceedingly prosperous and came to his own large flocks and maid servants and men servants and camels and donkeys. So Morris keeps on going. Jacob knew a great deal about sheep and goats and cattle, however, much more than Laban. He had kept his father's flocks for decades and now had been in charge of Laban's far for, uh, flock for over 14 years. As a very observant Laban's flocks for over 14 years. As a very observant and intelligent man, he had apparently learned something of what we now call 
Mendel, Mendelian, Mendel, that's right, Mendel, Mendelian genetics, simply by long continued observation of generation after generation of these animals. He knew that even though a species of animals may have certain dominant traits, such as the white color in this type of sheep, furthermore, actual physical vigor and usefulness for man's needs are quite independent of this matter of coloration. Jacob selectively breeded the animals with the recessive trait of abnormative coloration with one another in such a manner as to increase their numbers even more than under normative conditions of herd life. A certain proportion of the solid color animals would be homo, homo, homozog, homozogous, homozogous, okay, zygote, right, in this case with the same abnormative color genes, and if mated with homozygous animals, would bear only solid colored offspring. Ah, the heterozygous animals, which did contain in some proportion the genes of off-color progeny, would be the ones which would have to supply his own future flocks. But by selective breeding, he could eventually develop a flock predominantly spotted and speckled animals. Aha, it is scientific. Critics raise the question about Jacob's knowledge of science. His actions in peeling white stripes and rods from trees of poplar hazel and chestnut, or perhaps more likely storax, almond, and plane trees, as rendered in the NIV, and placing them in the cattle watering troughs, have been attacked as showing his belief in the outmoded ideas of prenatal influence. The idea is that Jacob supposed, by making the animals look at striped ride rods at the time of conception, he could induce them to bring forth striped offspring. The doctrine of prenatal influence is, of course, believed by modern zoologists to be nothing but an old wives' tale. It should not be overlooked, however, that Jacob was only 90 years old at this time. In those days, that was not all that old. That he was a very intelligent and a careful observer, and that he had spent most of his young, long life raising and studying cattle, sheep, and goats. He would have been most unlikely to have been taken in by a groundless superstition. There is a great deal even today that scientists have not been able to work out concerning the transmission of hereditary factors. In a certain population, there are multitudes of different characteristics which may appear in different individual animals of that species. The variational potential in the DNA molecular structure is tremendous. Ex exactly what it, what it is that determines the actual characteristics a particular individual or animal may have out of all of the potential characteristics that are theoretically available in the gene pool is not known, yet known, in any sufficient degree. It may be that Jacob had learned certain things about these animals which modern biologists have not yet even approached. There are indeed certain factors which can become prenatal influences and which can determine to some degree the physical characteristics of the progeny. Though it is surely very unlikely that an external image can be transmitted through a visual apparatus to the brain and thence in some way as a signal to the DNA structure to supply certain characteristics to be triggered in the embryo, it is nevertheless true that certain chemicals can and do have a significant prenatal influence. Aha! Uh -huh. If they can reach the embryo or, prior to conception, the DNA in the germ cells, it is possible that certain chemicals in the wood of these trees, peeled rods of which were actually in the water which the flocks came to drink, were capable somehow of affecting the animals, if nothing less. Water treated thus may serve as an aphrodisiac and fertility promoter among the cattle and other animals. At least one such chemical substance found in these trees has been used for such a purpose in both ancient and modern times. So you're calling Jacob a dummy, huh? Further, whether or not the sense of sight can actually mark the embryo in some way, there is no doubt that what one sees may have a strong effect on certain physiologic mechanisms on his body. The phenomena of blushing, the nauseous reactions produced by viewing gruesome sights, and the effect of pornographic pictures in stimulating the sexual apparatus are typically cases in point. The mere sight of the striped rods may have served simply as an aphrodisiac to the cattle when they came to drink. This, in fact, seems indi this, in fact, seems indicates indicated by indicated by verse 38, in which the word translated "conceive" in the King James version, in heat in NIV, is actually the Hebrew "yacham," meaning to be hot. In other words, to be in heat. That is, the verse may read, And he set the rods which he peeled before the flocks in the gutters in the watering troughs, when the flocks came to drink, that they should become hot or in heat when they came to drink. In some way, not understood, but apparently confirmed by many practical animal raisers, since the sight of white streaked rods seems 
to stimulate these animals to sexual activity. The bulk of the animals, which were Laban's, were made by Jacob to face toward the separate flock of speckled and spotted lambs, but were kept separate from them. The reason for having them thus oriented is not clear. Perhaps it was to make a subconscious impression on them that stripes and speckles were a mark of distinction in the flock, so as to make preparations for and augment the aphrodisiac influences of the striped rods. It is possible that as a symbolic gesture he had made, had them face toward the three days distant flock of Laban Street ring, ring Street cattle. Though they could not see them, this might have symbolized Jacob's confidence that Laban's pure color flock would eventually produce a new ring streak flock for himself. A further measure was taken by Jacob to ensure that the flocks so produced would be composed of strong animals. He divided the flocks into two shifts, composed of stronger and weaker animals, respectively. He used the rods and the troughs when the stronger animals drank, but not when the weaker ones came there. Thus the strong animals were stimulated to mate, and the others were not. This measure, likewise, to the extent it would be effective, constituted a sound practice of animal husbandry and should have been as, uh, as of as great benefit to Laban as to Jacob. It would ensure that, statistically at least, most of the newborn lambs and kids, whether solid color or spotted, would be sturdy and healthy. However, there continued to be produced an abnormally large population of spotted and speckled young. This meant that a greater and greater percentage of the animals in Jacob's flock were strong animals and an increasing percentage and Laban's were weaker animals. It was not until later that Jacob came to understand the providential intervention that caused the unusual percentage of street and spotted animals to be born. So continuing Genesis 31, 11 to 13. The angel of the Lord said to me in a dream, Jacob, I answered, here I am. And he said, look up and see that all the male goats mating with the flock are streaked, speckled or spotted. For I have seen all that Laban has been doing to you. I am the God of Bethel, where you anointed a pillar, and where you made a vow to me. Now leave this land at once and go back to your native land. So, scientifically, Jacob may have been right on. But spiritually, God was right on. In the meantime, within the space of only a few years, perhaps four or five, Jacob's flock had grown so large, and he had prospered from it so greatly, they had to employ many servants, both male and female, and had purchased many camels and asses. He had quickly become a very prosperous rancher. He had done so, not by any dishonest manipulation of his own, or by some mystical methodology, but by means of sound practices of animal breeding, which, by all normal standards, should have been of even greater benefit to Laban than to himself. The God of his fathers, however, had intervened in a marvelous and supernatural way as well. Interesting how God directed Jacob to do some scientifically concrete things to prosper the, the, uh, the animals and the flocks. And at the same time, God supernaturally prospered it all the more. Which, by dint of Till's point of view, you have to accept the fact that the God of the Bible is a supernatural Bible uh, God who will supernaturally intervene to favor those that he has decided sovereignly to bless.